We are talking about the making of modern Israel. I wanna do a pretty brief recap. As we covered, yeah, we covered 3,500 years last week. So uh, that was fat. You, hey, kudos to you guys, I mean, to take in that much data. But basically, I wanted to get you up to uh, World War I, so kind of what, how the Jews got dispersed. You remember this, how they got dispersed throughout the world, how uh, World War I with the rise of Islam and how the modern state started to happen. Then I wanna talk about World War II and the founding of the modern state of Israel in this lesson. Next time, I wanna talk about the, so that happened in 1948. Then I wanna talk about 67 war and the 73 war. That really made the boundaries of the modern state of Israel, the boundaries in 67 and 73. And then the last lesson, we'll talk about modern Israel, the intifadas, uh, the Palestinian Liberation Organization. We'll talk about the Abraham Accords. We'll, we'll talk about a, a lot, but knowing how Israel got there, I think is really helpful. So recap, World War I and the making of the modern Middle East, because this is what the Middle East looked like in 1914. So the Ottoman Empire is a Muslim empire. And there have been several Muslim empires from the time of Muhammad, 570 AD to 632 AD. And so then uh, in 620, you know, 22, they start boiling out of the Arabian Peninsula and going throughout the world. And by 1914, this whole area, the modern Middle East, was under the Ottoman Empire. When I say Ottoman, all that is, is these are Turkish Muslims who have an empire. Okay, it's that simple. So that's what's happening in 1914 in the Middle East. At the same time, there's about to be a communist revolution in Russia. The czars are gonna be overthrown, right, in the October Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution, a few years after this map and you will see communism rise in Russia. Shortly after that, you'll see communists rise and challenge the government of China. So a lot of upheaval around this World War I era. One other thing I wanna remind you of from this time period is I'm gonna use th three words and I'm gonna define uh, movements and people in three ways. One is by ethnicity. So Arab is an ethnicity. Jewish is an ethnicity, meaning it is a genetically describable group of people, okay? So you're ethnically Arab. That means your descendants are an, a describable group of people. Second is culture. Culture are your practices, your uh, traditions, your sometimes your moral framework, all those things are how groups of people have an agreed upon way of living with each other. That's called your culture. Sometimes ethnicities have unique cultures. Sometimes, like early America, for example, had a lot of ethnicities, but one common culture. So does that make sense? So ethnicity, culture, not necessarily the same thing. And then third, religion. And so you can be an Arab and be a Christian. You can be an Arab and be secular, you can be an atheist. You can be an Arab and be Muslim. So you have these three things coming together, ethnicity, culture, religion. It will help you very much when we get into the modern Middle East to realize, okay, wait, these are three different things. Nobody fits in nice, neat little buckets. Does that make sense? In fact, that's a good way of thinking about the, the whole world, contrary to critical theory which says everybody, this is, a, this is an editorial, everybody fits in a little bucket and you have to be whatever your bucket is. That's really, humanity is not quite that cut and dried and it certainly isn't here in the Middle East. So World War I happens over in 1918, a lot of changes. And between 1918 and uh, at the end, of, let me see if I'm gonna show you that map. Yeah, I will in a minute. So at the end of 1918, the Middle East, what we now know as Jordan and Israel, are British protectorates, meaning the people living there are basically have a British government. Syria and Lebanon had French governments. 
there. And they weren't necessarily colonizing so much. They weren't bringing British people or French people to live there. They were just running it because the Ottoman Empire collapsed. The Ottomans sided with Germany in World War I, and when they were defeated, whoa, the Ottoman Empire goes away, the government goes away, so you gotta move in and fill the vacuum. And that's what they did. The uh, people that are living in Israel at that time, there are a handful of Jewish people living in what we now call Israel, and th that land. So it wasn't a Jewish state, had a lot of Arab people living there, uh, but they used to be under the control of the Ottoman Empire. They weren't a unique political entity at that time. So they cordoned it off and it became a British protectorate. The British government, this is Lord Balfour, he was the foreign secretary, uh, secretary of state, basically, and he said that it is the, his majesty's government's stated intent that they are favorably disposed toward a Jewish state. In other words, the idea that they know that the Jews scattered around the world would like to come back to their ancestral homeland. And they were favorably disposed to that. At the same time, you have Zionism as a movement. Zionism, and you're gonna hear this word today. In fact, if you wanna hear the uh, enemies of Israel, when they talk about Israel, they'll talk about the Zionists. And if they talk about America, they'll talk about how we support the Zionists. What does that mean? Zionism is a movement. And it is a movement that has two components, but it's basically defined as the movement that supports the idea of a Jewish homeland, a Jewish nation within what we now call Israel, okay? In the area of Palestine. And so early, early on, Theodor Herzl started this idea. It starts catching on amongst certain Jews all around the world that, hey, we should have a piece of land in our ancestral homeland, way back to Abraham, 2000 BC, to where Jews can begin to return because we're just all strangers in a strange land, if you will. They thought of themselves, by the way, and this is a biblical theme I wanna touch on. If you know the biblical story, you know that the Jews were basically scattered, conquered and scattered in 586 BC, long, long, long time ago. They were scattered around in exile. So they were conquered by the Babylonians and they were scattered around and it's like, nah, you can't go home, you're in exile. And so this idea of returning from exile, which happened at the time, these are Old Testament books, Nehemiah, Ezra, Zechariah, Haggai, these little, these little books at the end of the Old Testament that you don't read, okay, what, those, what those are is that was when they got to go back. Some of them came back to Israel in the 400s BC. Then they get scattered again. But there is this idea in Judaism that they're still in exile. And there was at this time. And so Herzl said, look, we're still scattered around the world. And we'd like to return from exile and go back to the land of Israel. Well, that began to catch on. So it's a nationalist movement. Essentially what it is, is there needs to be a political entity, a nation where Jews can go back to. Some of the Zionists were secular people. They just wanted a Jewish nation from an ethnic point of view and a cultural point of view, a place where Jews could come together as an ethnic group of people who shared a common culture, right? Shared traditions, values, uh, you know, celebrations, etc., and lived there. Some of them also were religious. And they said, yes, we want that, but we really want to go back to the land God promised to Abraham. That's our land, okay? So Zionism is religious, but it's also secular. And so it's basically a movement to take the uh, Israelites back, but it's kind of seen in biblical terms as a return from exile. So at the beginning of World War II, this is what the map looks like. And so what you see here is in green, you'll see Palestine, that is the modern nation of Israel, but in those days it was called Palestine, an ancient name that the Romans gave this territory. Palestine, and you'll see Transjordan, think the nation of Jordan today, is under British rule, and then Syria and Lebanon are under French rule. And so this is what the world looked like in the Middle East at the start of World War II. So that's between the thing. How many Jews are there 
in Palestine at this time. Well, Zionism had kind of done its work. It went from, in the, the latest stats uh, that you have, is about 90,000 Jews in 1914. That's not very many. But by 1933, right before World War II, you have uh, 238,000. So you don't see mass migrations, but you see a lot of people coming back into the land. And I'm gonna talk in a few minutes about uh, when we get to World War II, how did the Jews live in the land? I told you last time, they had to buy the land from certain Arab tribes that were there. Those Arab tribes were not always ethnically Arabic, but they were Muslims, and Muslim, they took on the Arab culture and the Arab language a lot of times. But they bought land, not very good land usually, and they made it go of it, if you will. And I'll talk to you about that in a little bit. So, the beginning of World War II, this is, this is the events that led to the establishment of a, officially a Jewish state. So let's talk about World War II just a little bit. I know you probably know a lot about this, I suspect you do, although I don't really know how much is being taught in schools today about this because this World War II still exerts a political and moral influence throughout the world. But basically, you have the uh, Axis powers. So you have Germany, Italy, a couple others that band together. You see them color-coded here. And Germany invades Poland and covers, conquers about half of Poland. Well, that triggers the war. Adolf Hitler and the German Blitzkrieg conquering, and that triggers a war, and so France and Great Britain, England, declare war. And so at the beginning of this, the USSR has an agreement with the Germans. And so the USSR, opportunistic fellows, uh, communist, and so Stalin invades the other half of Poland and says, bonus, I'm gonna grab some land too. He grabs all this area up here, and eventually he's gonna move into Finland and conquer that as well. Well, that all works out really well for Stalin for a little while, and Germany ends up going through Netherlands, Belgium, goes into France and conquers France, doesn't conquer Spain. A guy named Franco is there leading his own little revolution. And you end up with basically Great Britain against all of Europe, and it's a great story. But fundamentally, Germany conquers this area and decides I'm gonna conquer Great Britain as well. What's the United States doing? Staying out of things. Because after World War I, it was a movement in the United States not to get involved in Europe's wars anymore. Too many young men had been killed and had died. So, things change. What happens next? Well, next, you see that Hitler, after he's conquered France and before he's conquered Great Britain, he's having a little trouble with that, decides, I'm gonna conquer the USSR as well. So he turns around and attacks Russia. And so Stalin goes into a deep, dark depression for about a week and thinks, oh my gosh, how can my good friend Adolf Hitler betray me? It's like, you gotta be kidding me. And so anyway, he, so he attacks the USSR. So now the USSR joins with, by this time, at the end of 1941, USA gets pulled in because Japan, who's joined with Germany, attacks America. And so now it's America and England uh, against the Axis powers. And so the USSR says, hey, I changed my mind, I wanna join you guys. You know, why don't you guys help me out here a little bit? And so they come together and you, you have this war going on. What is happening down here in the Middle East, in Palestine, etc.? Not much. You have German agents down there basically talking to the Arabic people and the Arab nations here, saying, we need oil and we don't want you to go with the other guys. You also see British agents down here saying the same thing. Hey, you guys stick with us. We win this war. We're going to do some good stuff for you. We're gonna give you a bunch of land and, and you'll get something out of this. Everybody's wheeling and dealing. And they managed to keep this part of the, of the world kind of neutral. They really didn't do anything. They're kind of out of the, the main course of the action in World War II. Well, you know how it turns out in World War II, uh, you have the uh, American forces and the Allied forces win the war. 
But near the end of World War II, something significant happens, and part of Hitler's program, in addition to conquering the world, is exterminating the Jews. And so you have the Holocaust. And again, I'm, I'm kind of going through this really quickly because I hope that you guys know this history in general. And so the, as he invaded Poland, by the way, there were 60 million people killed in World War II. Most of them were killed in the Soviet Union, China, Germany, and Poland. There were people killed everywhere. I mean, American soldiers, British soldiers, French soldiers, but of the 60 million people, most of them were USSR, Germany, China, Poland. And Poland had a lot of Jews because they were scattered around. So did Russia, so did everywhere. They were scattered all over the place. Hitler, as he conquers areas, starts rounding up the Jews, started in Germany, but then into Poland, etc. And he starts having these concentration camps and he has a program to literally exterminate the Jewish race. So this is an ethnic issue to him. It's not just the Jewish religion, it's the Jewish ethnic race. He wants that DNA out of the human gene pool completely. Kills about six million Jewish people, along with some other people, some uh, Roma and uh, a variety of other people, but fundamentally kills a lot of Jewish people and wants to literally exterminate the Jews. Well, once they win, and the Allies knew about this before the end of the war, but once they win, they see the full horror of these concentration camps and this whole program and the extent of this program. But he wasn't successful. He didn't stamp out all of the Jewish people. And so at the end of World War II, and this is what I wanna talk about that makes, that kind of ties into our story. So I, if you have questions, text them in, but that's kind of World War II in a nutshell. So how does that affect the nation of Israel? Well, you have the British that are sympathetic to the idea of a Jewish nation. On the other hand, the Arabs don't want that. They don't want Jews back in this area, partly because they are sparsely, but occupying this area. There are some people living there, but mainly because they don't think the Jews have a right to that area because Islam, which is the religion of most of these Arabic countries, not, and not just the Arabs, not just Saudi Arabia, but the Jordanians, the Egyptians, the Syrians, these are different ethnic people, but they're heavily, heavily Muslim at this time. Needless to say, the Muslims do not believe that the Jews have a right to that land. They believe that through Ishmael, their forefather, they have the right to that land. So the Arabs are against this idea. But uh, the America, Truman is supportive of the idea even though Truman overruled all of his advisors to support in the UN the, the, them carving out a place for a Jewish nation, a Jewish homeland. And the reason is, and not so much a moral thing, but a political thing, his generals and the statesmen believed that this would alienate the Arabs, they were right, that it would affect U.S. access to oil and energy in the future, they were right, that's still true today. Our president today is on his way to the Middle East saying, hey, would you guys pump more oil? And so this is relevant, is what I'm telling you. And so they said, look, we can't politically afford to support this, but Truman uh, insisted on it, and he felt like this is the right thing to do. The British were behind the idea, and so in the United Nations, came up with Resolution 181, and on November 29 of 1947, so it's a couple of years after the war's over, things are sorting themselves out. November 29, 1947, they passed a resolution, it's called the UN Partition Plan, and they partitioned Palestine into two nations, an Arab state and a Jewish state. And on this map, you can see the yellow is the Arab state, the way they partitioned it, and the orange is the Jewish state, the way they partitioned it. I think that, and the vote, by the way, if I remember right, was like 33-13. 33 to 13 in favor of this with a number of nations abstaining. And so it passed. Uh, it didn't have any teeth, but it passed. And so you have the official world body sanctioning a Jewish state and an Arab state, kind of a two-state solution, right? One of the things that pushed this over 
The hump was the whole world saw the incredible suffering of the Jewish people and the horrific genocide or attempted genocide of the Jewish people. And so I think that it overrode some of the political considerations and there was just a moral force to provide a safe place for the Jews. And that would be to bring them out of these territories and into a land where they at least had a chance to have their own nation and they could defend themselves. Now, if you look at this, I wanna make a couple observations. If you look at what's in orange, by the way, everything below south of Beersheba, that's just desert. I mean, there's just nothing there. The only reason you want that is because you got a seaport down here in Elat. That's a, the uh, city of Elat down there. If you drive down there today, all you see are secret government installations doing some kind of military stuff. I mean, it's just a perfect place. You, planes flying overhead, bombing stuff. It's a great place, but nobody lives there. So this is absolutely indefensible. You cannot defend this land the way it is. It's so narrow that your enemy could park their tanks on your border and in an hour overrun your whole country. So, but the Jews said, yeah, we'll do it. I mean, that's the best deal they've got going, right? The Arab nations around there did not accept it. They voted against it in the UN and they said, we don't agree with this deal. So what happens? Well, between November uh, 29th, 1947, a guy named David Ben-Gurion, who is a Jewish guy, gonna be the first president of the nation of Israel, and some of them decide, well, what are we gonna do? In other words, the UN has sanctioned it, none of the Arab neighbors are okay with it, and if we go ahead and say, yes, we are a Jewish state, they're probably going to attack us. And we don't have an army, we don't have any weapons, we don't have a government, we don't, we don't, we don't even have a dog catcher. I mean, we got nothing, you know? This is like, we got no state at all here. Because up until that time, you just have these little settlements, right? And so, what they decide to do then is they debate and debate and debate. And so, on May 14th, 1948, so six months later, they get together and they declare the Jewish state comes into existence, this is David Ben-Gurion, that he will be the first president and they establish a declaration of independence, basically. They have a constitution and they go, we are a nation. That was on May 14th. On May 15th, they got invaded by five Arab armies, literally the next day. And so these nations, uh, Egypt, this, they put the Saudis on here, but nobody ever talks about the Saudis. So. Egypt invades, and so does Iraq, and Jordan, and Syria, and Lebanon. And they have tanks, and they have cannons, and they have a lot of soldiers. And the uh, Israel, the new nation of Israel, they've pretty much got zilch. So how does this play out? Well, I wanna tell you the story of one place and it's kind of a great way to think about how this whole deal played out. What the way, uh, let me go back just a little bit and tell you how did the Jews settle the land? All the way from this, this kibbutz, I'm gonna tell you what a kibbutz is, but this settlement was the first one ever in Palestine, it was in 1910. But from 1910 all the way up to World War II, you've got 238,000 Jews what did they do? Did they come, they get jobs, what did they do? Well, sometimes they would have wealthy Jews like the Rothschilds uh, bought a lot of land. They would talk to the, the Arab sheiks, the tribal leader in this area, they would buy a chunk of land, pay them good money for it, and then say, Jews, you can move back here. And you saw a lot of young Jewish people, almost always young people, move back there. Usually the land wasn't good. There was a lot of malaria, a lot of swamps, etc. And so they worked and worked and worked to make a go of it. Not every settlement made a go of it, but many of them did. This settlement called Deganya was settled by eight men and one woman. And they began to work this land and try to become self-sufficient. They were attacked occasionally by their Arab neighbors. It was a very difficult 
thing because Arabs didn't necessarily want them there. Uh, and so it was a very difficult way to start. So how do you start an agricultural, self-sufficient town from scratch? Well, they did it on a socialist model. And this socialist model was kind of like a commune. And if you think about it, it's a brilliant way to start these uh, settlements. It's really the only way, because nobody was supporting them. It's not like a government or somebody said, you guys go in and we'll fly you in food for a while. We'll buy you tractors. We'll send you seeds. Nobody helped them. And so you go in and you needed a communal way of living and working. And the name for these communal um, establishments are called a kibbutz. And that's how you say it. You will hear that today because they're still making some of these settlements in the West Bank, which just ticks off the Palestinians to no end. And you'll hear about that in the news, but they're called kibbutzes or kibbutzim in Hebrew. So a kibbutz is a communal uh, way of living just to survive. It's not a political entity so much as it is, look, you work the fields, you cook the food, uh, you do this work, uh, you run the tractor, and we're just all gonna share our food and stuff. Does that make sense? So it's like a commune, and it's socialist, meaning, okay, what if somebody gets sick? Well, we're all gonna help pay for the doctor to come. And in other words, they, it was by necessity. So these were little socialist enclaves, and it worked really well. It's changed a little bit today. Uh, they're not a socialist country, per se, today. They're a democracy, but it's interesting how it started out. So these, these Jews were really trying to make it. The suicide rate was very high because you just literally worked all day, all the time. I mean, there's eight men, there's one woman, okay? I mean, it's not like a lot of girls came and said, oh, this is how I wanna live my life. I wanna be on a commune and make a living out of nowhere. And you know, it's just a whole lot better to stay in Poland, right? Or wherever you were living. So, but 238,000 Jews did. And it was very, very hard. This is an interesting little kibbutz for two reasons. Number one, the second child that was born in this kibbutz shortly after 1910 was a guy named Moshe Dayan. Moshe Dayan is gonna play heavily into the story next time in the 67 and 73 war. But he was the second child born in the first kibbutz ever in the land of Israel. Second reason it's famous is I wanna tell you how in the world did the Jews not get literally wiped out? Because the Arab armies, the armies from those nations around, their goal was, and I'm not trying to make a moral statement here, I'm just trying to tell you some history. This is just the way it is, people. They were going to kill every Jew that was there. Their goal was drive them into the sea, we are going to eradicate you. Now they weren't gonna to go to Poland and kill all the Jews there, that was Hitler's program, but you're here, you're gonna die. Men, women, children, you're out of here. We do not accept that you are here. So Israel's fighting literally for their life, or the Israelites, the people that are there, the Israelis that are there. And they're not very well connected. It's not like they have much of a government. I mean, literally, they just declared independence yesterday, and now they get invaded today, right? So very difficult. And so they were, the fighting was usually kibbutz by kibbutz. They don't have any tanks, they don't have anything. This tank is sitting out in front of Deganya now. We always go by there and talk about this story just a little bit. But I wanna tell you what happened there. That is a French Renault tank from World War I. And the Syrians have this tank. By the way, I should show you where Deganya is. Deganya is right here on the Sea of Galilee, southern end and the Syrians invaded here. And the Syrians came to Deganya, and they had their tanks, and they rolled up there, and that doesn't look like an impressive tank to you, but it looks real impressive when all you got is a rifle, all right? So what happened, they knew they were coming, and so the kibbutz probably had 30, 40 people, you know, at this time, I mean, it was bigger, and so they sent all the women and children away. Two women stayed to cook, and they had a handful of men. I, I forget the exact number, uh, 16, 17 guys. And they had rifles, that's it. And so what's gonna happen? I'll just tell you how this should happen. They're gonna get overrun, they're all gonna get killed. This isn't even gonna be, this isn't even gonna be a battle. Israel should lose this war in a couple of days. I mean, literally. 
But here's what happened. This tank is there as a monument. This tank comes rolling up. They've dug a trench. And when the tank comes rolling up, all they've got, they don't have grenades, they don't have uh, cannons, but they've got Molotov cocktails. So you got a jar filled with gasoline. They light it. One guy stands up, throws it, hits the tank, and of course it goes on fire. That's not gonna hurt a tank at all. I mean, it's good for PR, but I mean, it isn't gonna hurt the tank. But when they see that, the Syrians go, oh no, these dudes may have something serious. They literally retreat. And they left that tank and it's still sitting there since 1948 as a monument. If you talk to Israelis today, some of them are religious. I'll talk to you about this in week four. How many Jews in Israel today are actually religious Jews? How many are cultural Jews? How many are religious Jews? Doesn't matter. You ask them today, how in the world did you win that war against five Arab armies? And their answer will be, had to be God. There is no, and whether they believe in God or not, had to be God. I mean, there is no way in the world you win that battle. But there are hundreds of stories like this story. If they had just gone on, they would have realized, Are you kidding me, you got 17 guys with rifles here. You know, I got a thousand soldiers. I mean, you shouldn't win this war. And yet they do. I mean, this is insane. They actually force the Arab armies back outside their territory. And so that's a short version of their war of independence. Now, the Arabs have another name for this. So in Israel, this is the War of Independence. And if you go to May 14th, if you happen to be there in May, which we were last time, they're gonna celebrate Independence Day, July 4th, on May 14th, right? Because that's their Independence Day. It's when they became a nation. And so they'll celebrate that and they'll remember this and they will remember how they actually achieved statehood. So that's kind of the story, and Deganya is the first kibbutz, but that story is just replicated over and over in Israel. It's literally inexplicable uh, on how they did it, uh, how they were able to force that out. Now, here's an interesting question. So what in the world is the rest of the world doing at this time? Now, everybody knows the UN doesn't have any teeth. I mean, they do the resolution, but the Arab army's invaded. Do you see any soldiers? I don't, you don't see any soldiers. The Israelis are like, I don't see any UN soldiers here. And they, they didn't, and they were just kind of ineffective. I mean, that's just, a, that's just a historical fact. But the rest of the world, what are they doing? America supported this. Britain supported this. Well, let me tell you what they're doing. So let's talk about the rest of the world a little bit. So the Jews end up winning, and I'll show you what the nation looked like when they got done. But... At the same time, everybody's attention is focused in Europe because now that World War II is over, Britain and America realize, oh my gosh, we just went from the frying pan to the fire. We got this expansive, aggressive communist regime in the USSR that as part, and credit to Stalin, ruthless, but very successful. And so look what they did. They ended up with a ton of territory under their control in Europe. And they decide, we're zealous communists, we're gonna conquer the rest of the world too. We are ideologically destined to conquer the rest of the world. So what does the United States, Great Britain, France is reconstructing, Great Britain is economy's ruined, they're pretty weak. Spain, oh, those guys are half communists themselves. And so what the United States is doing is they realize, oh my goodness, the biggest threat to us is world communism. These guys are serious. I mean, we got a nuclear weapon, so does the USSR, thanks to spies. And so they come up with this idea, you may not remember this historically, of containment. And so the United States is exclusively focused, I mean, taking all their armies home, focused on containing the Soviet Union. That means they're pouring tons of money into these countries. Uh, and so Germany gets split down the middle. So they are trying to contain the Soviet Union. And from 1948 until the time of Nixon and Kissinger, I think 68, this is US policy. This is all we can think of is the Cold War. And so the US is very supportive of Israel, but like, dude, do not have time. 
I, I'm sorry, I can't even return your phone calls right now. I got the USSR making a lot of trouble over here. How does the USSR make trouble? Well, they don't exactly have a war, but guess where Berlin is? Berlin is sitting right in the middle of the Soviet part. And half of it is East Berlin that belongs to the Soviets, and half of it is West Berlin that is free, is Western. Well, West Berlin's doing real well, right? East Berlin, not so well, right? They're not economically very good. Soviet Union was never economically very good because the ideology was bankrupt. But basically, communism, socialism, that's just a bankrupt idea. But, so, <clears throat> Stalin and later Khrushchev realized, if I wanna squeeze the West, all I've gotta do is West Berlin. These dudes are gonna try and defend West Berlin. It's in the middle of my territory. They can't even get trucks in here unless I let them get trucks in here. And so they start messing around with West Berlin. They put up a blockade. You, you guys are way too young to remember this, but really smart politics. But they start goading the US. US is like, oh my gosh, we can't go to war over West Berlin. We better fly in all the supplies. And I mean, it just gets tense and it totally occupies the United States. So poor Israel's left on their own. Not only that, but now I'm gonna take you to the other end of the Soviet Union. We're gonna to go to Asia now. China is also communist. And China says, we're also gonna take over the world. China and Russia shake hands and say, comrade, we won't fight each other. I'm gonna go take over Europe. That's fine with me. I'm gonna take over Southeast Asia. And they do, they start taking over Southeast Asia. What happens just a few years after the end of World War II? Korean War. Communists in North Korea? invade South Korea. What does the US do? Containment strategy. We can't be having this happen. You know, we gotta go defend that. Shortly after that, Vietnam. Oh my gosh, North Vietnamese communists invading South Vietnam. Guess we better go do that. Needless to say, containment strategy was not one of the more brilliant ideas that America ever had. Not very workable. Nevertheless, the US has its hands full with global communism from 48 to 68. And so, for most of that time, Israel is kind of on their own. And so amazingly though, with very little outside support, if any, from any of the other nations, they end up winning that war. And so at the end of the War of Independence in uh, May, June of 48, this is how Palestine ends up looking. So you have the nation of Jordan, just call that Jordan, they changed their name. You have Egypt down here, Syria and Lebanon, and they've all been kicked out and contained. And Israel quickly begins to build an army. And they quickly begin to bring Jews from all over the world. Now that they have a nation, they don't need anybody's permission. The Jews don't need anyone's permission. It used to be they needed the British's permission to go there. But now it's a nation, they can go. You know, they go to a seaport and they just start showing up and they start kibbutzes, they start an army and they quickly, quickly begin to arm. The Arab world, and when I say the Arab world, I mean these Muslim nations all around them. And there is a league of these Muslim nations. They are absolutely humiliated by this. So I told you the Israelis called this the war of independence the Arab nations around them called it al-Nakba, which means the catastrophe. And it's really important to recognize that because that's going to have reverberations all the way to today, is the Arab nations felt like, how in the world did this measly bunch of Jews defeat our armies? And they were humiliated on the world stage. I mean, what does the rest of the world think about them? Man, those Arab armies must be really bad. It's kind of a little bit like uh, Russia and Ukraine today. You know, Russia goes rolling into Ukraine. Everybody says, well, this war is going to last about a week. And where are we now? Months into this thing, and they still haven't run, uh, run. So what you heard on the world stage is, wow, it doesn't look like the Russian army is nearly as advanced or as technological as we thought they were, right? This is that on steroids, right? It's like, you, seriously, you can't even defeat them. And so this was humiliating 
to the Arab world. And it drove, a movement now begins in the Arab world. And I'm really gonna pick this up next year. So in 1948, when they failed to conquer them, the next big war is gonna be 19 years later in 67. What's happening in between that time? Arab nationalism, what's called pan-Arab nationalism, begins to take force, and that is, look, we're having trouble because we're all these different nations. We're all Muslim, and we're all Arabic, at least in culture, right? I mean, Egyptians are ethnically Egyptians, but they have Arab culture because they were conquered by the Muslims, you know, 1,300 years before. And so we feel a sense of brotherhood, religiously and culturally, and so we need to come together. And so the leaders of these nations, particularly Syria and Egypt, begin to vie for with one another to say, look, why don't you just let me be the ruler of all the Arabs and I guarantee you I'll kick these Jews out of here. So for the next 19 years, the Arabs begin to work with each other like we gotta get rid of these Jews and how are we gonna do it? And they begin arguing with each other and they begin trying to find a way to come together. Instead of having five armies, let's just have one big pan-Arab nation. So that's kind of a movement then that is gonna play all the way up to the Nixon Kissinger years. Second thing that happens, Cold War, you get a stalemate. The U.S. is kind of containing China, kind of containing Russia. So if you're Russia, you think, look, I'm not going to attack Europe. Got this whole NATO thing going here and all of that. I know I'll leapfrog them and I'll start making trouble elsewhere in the world. So guess what Russia does? They go waltzing up to the Arabs. So you got Saudi Arabia down here. They go to Egypt, they go to Syria, and they go to Jordan, and they go... Uh, to Lebanon, but really Egypt and Syria are the big players then. And they say to them, you know, you cannot trust the Jews. You already know that, but you really can't trust America. I mean, honestly, those guys told you and the British told you if they won World War II, they were gonna give you guys control of this. And look what they did. They stabbed you in the back and they voted to make a Jewish nation. Don't you just hate their guts? Yeah, me too. And so the Russians say, you know what you guys need? good equipment. We'll sell you missiles and we'll sell you tanks and we'll sell you guns and we'll bring in military advisors. We'll help equip you so you can solve your little problem with the Jews. And by the way, did I mention that I could use some oil, right? And so Russia decides, I'm gonna go back to the Arabs and have a great relationship with the Arabs. Time out. So what's Russia doing today? Russia is seriously into Syria, and they are arming that army, and they are equipping that army, and they're trying to get a foothold back in the Middle East with the Arabs. So Truman's advisors were right. The Arabs were predisposed poorly toward America and saw America as supporters of their sworn enemies, the Jews and the Jewish nation. So America then says, wait a minute, we can't have Russia having all this influence in the Middle East. We've got to counter Russia, counter global communism, wherever it shows up. And so America says, Israel, my buddy, I'm going to arm you. And so you get these proxy wars. USSR, America, not going to war with each other directly, but what we'll do, we'll cause trouble for each other by arming other people. And that's how you see, even to today, the U.S. is the big supporter of Israel militarily, and Russia is the big supporter of Syria. Some things have changed, and we'll get to that. So I just want you to realize that started then. And it started then because there was a stalemate in Europe between America and its allies and the Soviet Union. Okay, so just a little history that started in 1948, but you're going to see it play itself out today. We'll take some questions and then I wanna finish by talking about some key questions like, who are the Palestinians and where are they in this time period? Because that's gonna become really important today. Question. Can you talk a little bit about uh, Christians in this region, Christian Arabs or other Christians that were in this region during this time? Yes, good question. So, being Arab is an ethnicity so if you're in Saudi Arabia, you're an Arab. It's also a culture. 
and then Islam is the religion. Well, if you're in Egypt, you're not ethnically an Arab. I mean, you're all Semitic peoples, but you're not ethnically an Arab, but you are culturally Arab and you are religiously Muslim, by and large, as a nation. And so if you lived in Palestine, if you lived in Jordan, you lived in Syria, you were culturally Arab, you were conquered 1,300 years ago, and you were religiously Muslim. But there are Arabs, there are Egyptians, there are Syrians, there are Jordanians who are ethnically those, they are religiously Christian. And so today, there are Arab Christians as well as Arab Muslims, as well as some Arab atheists too, but big picture, majority, huge majority Muslim. Some of them though are Christian. So for example, if you go today to Israel and uh, Bethlehem is in what's gonna be called later the West Bank, and I'll get to that in a minute. So it's uh, in an area controlled by Muslim Arab governments. There are Arabs who are Christians in Bethlehem used to be about 30% of the population. And over the time we've been taking groups there, that has dwindled to about 10% of the population of Bethlehem is now Christian Arabs. So that's why I wanted you to, re to think about this idea that your ethnicity and your culture and your religion are different things. So there are not a lot of Arab Christians. There are not a lot of Egyptian Christians, but they are there. And occasionally in the news, you'll see that Egyptian, well, they call them Coptic, Christians, that's just Egyptian Christians. And so the, you'll see some of their uh, churches being burned not long ago by uh, their Egyptian uh, Muslim neighbors burning it down. So you'll see religious strife even in the same ethnicity. So there are Christians in the Middle East, they're a huge minority in the Middle East, not easy to be Christian there. By the way, one of the things that we support here, many other people do too, is a ministry called Sat7. Sat7 broadcasts video into Middle Eastern nations in Arabic, Christian stories, Christian messages, and, that's, and a lot of educational things. And that's one of the ways to reach people who speak Arabic for Christianity. Okay, so let's talk about in 1949, how this plays out. So in 1949, you get this Gaza, this little area of Gaza called the Gaza Strip, and that was not conquered. And that basically belonged to Egypt at that time. So Egypt controlled this city of Gaza and this little strip of land that's come to be known as the Gaza Strip. This area is come to be known, and I'm gonna start referring to it as the West Bank. What does that mean? It's on the west bank of the Jordan River. This is the Jordan River right here. And at this time, Jordan is the government of that area. People living in that area in 1948 were Jordanians. Do you, know what, do you hear what I'm saying? Now, ethnically, oh man, some of them probably came from Syria, some of them probably came from Egypt, some of them are Arabs, some of them might have been born in Jordan. In other words, this is a ethnically kind of mixed group of people. There is no ethnicity called Palestinian. And again, I'm not making a political statement. I'm just trying to explain how these words are being used. And I just want us to get it historically right. I just, I just would like us to know what historically is the case. The people that lived there were not Palestinian ethnically because there is no such thing. They were Jordanians, Egyptians, Arabs, Iraqis, whatever, people that happened to be living in that area at that time. Mostly Muslims and mostly tribal. But from 1948 all the way to 1967, okay, so the next 20 years, they're Jordanian citizens. And so they come under the King of Jordan. And in fact, Jerusalem is split. You can't really tell it on here, Jerusalem is split down the middle. When you go there today, you'll be on a road and you'll say, oh, by the way, in 1948, that side of the city, that side of the road was Jordan. And that side of the city was Israel. And needless to say, you'll see bullet holes still in the buildings there because there were all kinds of skirmishes going on, even though there's no war at that point. But is, Jerusalem is split down the middle. 
and half of it's Jordan, and half of it is uh, Israel. So the people that lived in what is today called the West Bank were Jordanian citizens. They were religiously almost entirely Muslim, and they were ethnically various different people from that area. Is that helpful? I, I, and so they've been given the label Palestinians, but this is who those people were. And until this time, they didn't have, at this time, if you said, what are you guys? They'd go, well, I guess we're Jordanians. We live in Jordan, All right? West Bank was Jordan at that time. Question. Bedouins. Ah, Bedouins. You gotta love Bedouins. Okay, so Bedouins are, they don't have any nation. In fact, they don't even like the idea of a nation. You remember Abraham. So now I'm back to 2000 BC. Abraham was a nomad. There were nomads. Nomad is a description of a lifestyle, okay? It's, it's not a description of an ethnicity. It's not a description of a religion. It's not even, it's, I guess you could call it a culture because it's that lifestyle. Nomads live in tents and they move around. They have no permanent home and they typically have herds and they move with the herds. You have nomadic lifestyle everywhere on the earth at some point in time. You still have nomads in China, northern China, that live a nomadic lifestyle. Uh, and so you, you still have nomads in some part of the area that they just move around. I mean, they don't care whose land it is. It's like, there's grass, here's my sheep, that's my place, you know? I'll be here for a month and then I'm gonna move on. That's a nomad. A Bedouin is a name that we give to, I need a different map. Man, I'm loving this series with these maps. But basically, think about in Saudi Arabia, during that time, you have tribal groups. If you said, who are you? Oh, I'm a member of such and such tribe. That's who you are, that was your identity, right? Is you're a member of this tribe. So Bedouins are people who live a nomadic lifestyle they are Muslim, and their ethnicity is Arab. And so they used to be in the Arabian Peninsula, what's called Saudi Arabia. There's still Bedouins in Saudi Arabia, and they just move around with their flocks. Well, there were Bedouins in this area, and there still are. When you go to Israel today, you can see Bedouins who live in tents and move around, and they are a pain in the neck because if you're a homeowner, Imagine in your neighborhood, somebody moves in, you wake up in the morning, there's a tent and sheep eating your front yard, right? And you go, you can't do this, this is my territory. And they go, we're Bedouins. We don't even believe in the idea of territory. Now, I don't even know what you're talking about. And so this is what we do. What tribe are you in? I'm in this tribe, right? I mean, seriously, it's just a different way of living. So Bedouins are nomadic peoples, fewer and fewer of them, by the way. The Israeli government, is starting to buy them houses and build houses and say, why don't you guys live here? Funniest thing though, you will not see a Bedouin without a cell phone nowadays. <laughs> and when, when we go, we often go, and sometimes you will see Bedouin girls and children, because men do not do the flocks. I mean, that's whoa, way beneath their dignity, right? And so the kids and the women are, you know, are basically the shepherds. And you'll see the flock out there and up on the hill, you'll see kids, mom and a kid, whatever, whoever is shepherd. And they're in the traditional robes and they're making their food over a little fire and they will whip out a cell phone. And it's just the funniest thing ever. But they live a nomadic lifestyle. So a Bedouin is a Muslim, almost always Arab, and they live a nomadic lifestyle through this whole area. But there are fewer and fewer Bedouins who are actually living a nomadic lifestyle into the 21st century. So that's, that's a good question, all right? So this kind of sets us up pretty well. You now have a Jewish state. The UN partition is not what they ended up with because the Arabs never accepted that and they invaded. And so Egypt, or the Israelis then, they thought, well, I can't believe it, we're gonna win this thing. Well, if we're gonna win this thing, we're gonna push them back to a border where we can defend ourselves. Right, I told you that UN partition is indefensible. This is tough to defend because Tel Aviv is your big city. It is not very far away. In fact, today an Israeli F-16 
you can hardly even train over the country of Israel. It takes them about six seconds to transit the whole country. You know, I mean, it's tiny, and so it's very hard to do. But what they decided, as you'll notice, this is a little bigger area than what the UN mandate was. They said, look, we're gonna take half of Jerusalem, at least, you know, and we'll give the Jordanians the rest, and we are gonna take more land. Now, Syria still has, at this point, the Golan Heights, that's right here. This is highlands, and so they would shoot from 1948 to 1967, their snipers would shoot down into the kibbutzes, uh, the farmers and stuff, and they would shell them occasionally as well. Uh, Gaza, you'd have occasionally the same thing. You'd have some shelling and some attacks out of here, and then over here in what's the West Bank area, uh, you just had it cordoned off, and the Israelis eventually decided to build a fence. So you can't just walk out of the West Bank and shoot somebody. I mean, through the 50s, you would see school buses being blown up, uh, 60, if you remember this era, a lot of terrorism. In other words, our armies didn't defeat you, but we're not done, and we're gonna go blow up things. And so this is actually the beginning of terrorism as you know it today, started in that time frame because the Arabs were humiliated in not being able to militarily defeat the Israelis. So again, I'm not making a partisan statement. That's where that came from. Terrorism started th at this point in time. Hijacking airplanes, blowing up school buses, suicide bombers, all that stuff started then as a way for the Arabs to continue to press against the Jews. But all this time, you get a couple of very interesting Arab leaders uh, rising up. And they are plotting a way to restore Egyptian prestige and Arab prestige and destroy them. And so, 19 years later, they hatch their plan. And in 1967, they're ready to invade again. And you have to wait till next week to see what happened. So, that's what we will talk about next time. Thank you guys very much.